Rasputin was a paradox. A holy man, the guise of an unwashed, foul-mouthed peasant. With reputation as a healer sent from God, he quickly worked his way into the daily life of the royal family in Russia. To the Tsar and his wife, he was a holy man, sent by God himself. However, to the Russian people, Rasputin symbolised everything that was wrong with the imperial government and Tsarism. His presence in the royal court only angered the people further and hastened the seemingly inevitable overthrow of the Roman family that brought an end to Tsarist Russia. Born in Siberia in 1869, Rasputin came from a prosperous peasant background, his family owning the land on which they farmed and raised horses. When Rasputin was eight years old, him and his older brother Dmitri both almost drowned swimming in a nearby river. Unfortunately, his brother Dmitri died a few days later from pneumonia, but it was this experience that Rasputin claimed to receive the gift of clairvoyance and healing from God. He briefly attended school but failed to learn how to read or write before dropping out. Marrying at a young age, he had three children before embarking on a pilgrimage, travelling by foot through Greece and the Middle East. On his pilgrimage, Rasputin became interested in a renegade sect of the Russian Orthodox faith, and believed the only way to reach God was through the forgiveness of sinful acts and often indulged in stealing, drinking and womanising. Possibly driven by the stories of the sickly Prince Alexei, Rasputin arrived in St. Petersburg, where he quickly went over the local bishop and became a preacher. During the early 20th century, Russia was a country heavily dominated and influenced by religion, superstitions and spiritualism. Men like Rasputin commanded enormous interest and respect as they were seen as men of God. The ruler during this era was Tsar Nicholas II, who had succeeded his father Alexander II in 1894. Conditions in Russia at this time were not optimistic, with food being scarce and the people forced to pay heavy taxes the gap between peasant and noble widening with each passing day. Most citizens were not satisfied with the Tsar's autocratic rule and wanted him replaced with a more democratic ruling government. Rasputin arrived at a time when Russia was trying to establish a constitutional monarchy. A constitutional monarchy is one which has a monarch acting as a head of state but within the confines of a constitution. Vladimir Lenin, who established the first Russian communist government in 1917, Contrast his communist government to Tsarism in Russia. There cannot be the slightest doubt that from the standpoint of the working class and the labouring masses of all of Russia, the lesser evil would be the defeat of the Tsarist monarchy, the most intolerant and barbarous of governments. Russia was on the brink of a revolution, and with the peasant Rasputin standing beside the Tsar as an equal, the people were quickly losing respect for their monarch. In 1904, the young Russian prince and only heir to the throne Alexei was born and diagnosed with haemophilia, a condition where the blood does not clot, often leaving sufferers to bleed out from even minor injuries. The Tsarina Alexandra, a descendant of Queen Victoria, was desperate to save her son, and when doctors could do nothing for him, she quickly lost faith in them. It was during this time Rasputin had moved to St. Petersburg and had achieved recognition as a healer amongst the aristocratic circle of the city. One of Rasputin's clients was a confinement and leading in waiting to the Tsarina and recommended Rasputin to her sometime in early 1905, suggesting his prayers might benefit her sick son. Somehow, Rasputin managed to stop Alexei's bleeding and soon became a regular visitor of the royal court. Whether it was due to Rasputin's supposed healing abilities is a matter of historical debate. Some suggest that because Rasputin did not believe in modern medicine, he pushed the doctors away when they tried to administer Alexei penicillin. In the early 20th century, the effects of penicillin were not fully understood and was given to almost any patient. When the doctors were giving Alexei penicillin to relieve some of the pain, it was actually increasing the bleeding and accelerating his haemophilia due to the drug causing the blood to thin out even further. Whatever the case, the Serena was convinced that Rasputin's presence reduced the frequency and intensity of Alexei's haemophilic episodes and quickly formed a close bond with him. Alexandra was known to be a very superstitious woman and believed Rasputin was sent to her from God to save her son. The Tsar was more sceptical, but was not inclined to question or challenge a religious figure. Nicholas II also took into consideration the impact dismissing Rasputin from the court would have on his wife. 
the Tsar once said in private, better one Rasputin than ten fits of hysterica a day from Alexandra. Rasputin was supplied an apartment in St. Petersburg, and when he was not giving spiritual advice to the royal family, he was often providing it to at least two dozen upper-class women. Rasputin was reported to have boasted often that the Tsarina of the throne were in his hands and his command. Alexander Kurensky, a major political leader before and during the Russian revolutions of 1917, says of Alexandra's attachments to Rasputin. The Tsarina's blind faith in Rasputin led her to seek counsel in not only personal matters, but also on questions of state policy. A general held in high esteem by Nicholas II tried to talk to the Tsarina about Rasputin, but only succeeded in making an implacable enemy of her. To the people of Russia, this dependence on Rasputin was seen as a weakness of the Tsar and the Tsarina, helping destroy the general respect they had for their monarch. During the First World War, Nicholas II, at the urging of Rasputin and his wife, left to take command of the army fighting on the Eastern Front in September 1915, leaving Alexandra to manage domestic affairs in his absence. Russia at this time was one of the major powers of the world and was up against Germany who was being attacked from all sides. The Russians expected a quick victory with their overpowering numbers and weakened opponent, but instead suffered many humiliating defeats. It was hoped Nicholas II's royal presence on the battlefield would help boost morale, and while it did, it did not last long. The Tsar possessed very little militaristic knowledge and almost devastated the Russian army with his terrible battle strategies, leaving the blame of defeat swirly on his shoulders. Back home, domestic affairs were going just as dismally, with the German-born Tsarina already target of scurrilous rumours and questioned her loyalty to Russia. Alexander grew even more dependent on Rasputin, with several roles within the high government being filled by his appointees during this period allowing him further influence over state affairs and to curry favour with his benefactors and drinking partners. Between September 1915 and February 1917, Russia went through four prime ministers, three war ministers and five interior ministers, most of them replaced at Rasputin's command. The hiring and firing of so many different ministers in such a short period of time led to disestablishing an already floundering government. During this period, Rasputin was a godsend for socialists and reformists, who pointed to his political interference and ludicrous nocturnal activities as evidence that Tsarism was rotten to the core. As Rasputin's fortunes rose in St. Petersburg, so did the number of his enemies. Rasputin supposedly predicted his own death, but this could be done with simple logic, as it was well known many groups wanted him dead. By 1916, Rasputin appeared to many as a malevolent puppeteer, pulling the strings of the Tsarina and manipulating the government. It was in the same year that a group of aristocrats led by Prince Felix Yusupov, a minor Russian royal related to the Tsar, set out to murder Rasputin. The plot to kill Rasputin was a simple one, involving cakes and wine laced with potassium cyanide, lethal if ingested. Rasputin ate three cakes and guzzled numerous glasses of wine, consuming enough cyanide to kill six men, but did not die. When this failed to kill him, the nervous Yusupov ran upstairs to inform his conspirators that the poison had had no effect. Retrieving a pistol, he made his way back downstairs where he then shot Rasputin repeatedly before finally throwing his body into the Neva River. His body was recovered from the river on the 19th of December 1916 by a search team issued by the Tsarina, who was frantic at the disappearance of Rasputin. A post-mortem report by Professor Dmitry Kotorotov reveals that the examination shows no trace of poison and water is present in the lungs, showing that Rasputin did not consume any poison supposedly given to him by his murderers, and instead only died from drowning when submerged in the river. <laughs> His death was supposed to save Tsarism, and while the royal family were mourning the loss of him, the rest of Russia was celebrating his death. According to Alex Bloch, a Russian lyrical poet at the time, the utter exceptional quality of the debauched peasant shot in the back at Yusupov's gramophone party is perceived most of all that the bullet that killed him hit the heart of a ruling dynasty. Rasputin's death provided one of the final blows to the Tsar's reign, and two months later in February 1917, in the space of just a few days, Tsarist Russia came to an end. The Romanov family was overthrown and the monarchy was no more. 
in their place of the Bolshevik Party, a faction of the Russian Socialist Democratic Labour Party. And on July 16, 1918, almost 18 months after the death of Rasputin, the Bolshevik rule cold-bloodedly wiped out the former Tsar and his family in revenge for the past and in fear of the future. Needless to say, Russian Tsarism was well on the way out before Rasputin's introduction into the royal court. But it was his presence that eliminated any possible recovery for the Russian monarchy. The Russian people despised him, as he was known as a symbol for everything that was wrong in their country. It is truly unknown if Rasputin possessed any godly healing abilities, but the influence he was able to distribute over the royal family is certain, and it was this power that brought a hastened end to Tsarism in Russia. Russians.